Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hello, everyone. My name is Malika. I'm still an alcoholic. Malika. Um, it's really good to be here. I'm super grateful for the opportunity to be of service. Um, I guess starting out with my qualifiers, I my sobriety date is April 13th, 2017. So, God willing, I'm looking at that two-year mark in the not-so-distant future. Knock on wood. Um, and uh, I have a sponsor who has a sponsor. I... I'm currently in the middle of my fourth step. I'm trying to finish. I have a date set for Tuesday to do the fifth step, so I'm going to try to get seriously to work um, between now and then. Um, and I'm really grateful to be sober. Uh, a little briefly what it was like. I, Well, for me, I didn't really couldn't see my alcoholism clearly until I got sober. Um, so... When I came into the rooms, it was because I crashed my car, and before then, I was really good at um, rationalizing and focusing on the proof that I wasn't an alcoholic versus facing all the pile of evidence that maybe I was. Um, I think we're all pretty good at that denial, self-deception um, game. And But the car crash was something that I couldn't explain away or ignore, so it scared me enough to come into the rooms. Um, I had been introduced to 12-step programs briefly before then, um, so I had the app on my phone. I was able to like make it through the rest of the work week and then find a meeting that Saturday and got a temporary sponsor. And after getting sober, um, with a little bit of time, I was able to look back at my life more clearly. And was like, oh, it wasn't. It wasn't just the car crash. <laughs> There's some other evidence uh, before then. Um, and I think one of the reasons I was able to see more clearly, like I had um, tried controlling my using in other ways over the years, um, and I would uh, stop one form of alcohol. So I'd like stop drinking for a little while, and then my use of a different form of alcohol would increase or like stop that and regular drinking would increase. But I never, this was the first time that I actually stopped everything all at once and was like actually just sober, 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 um, and forced to look at myself more honestly. And so the first, um, wave of that was realizing like oh the first time I ever drank I'm pretty sure I blacked out I don't remember like some people talk about like that feeling of peace and like everything's right in the world I don't remember that but I, I definitely blacked out and um have always been a binge drinker where I have no like one of the way, uh, ways I proved to myself that I wasn't an alcoholic is that I never drank every day um and rarely drank alone um, but whenever I drank, I could never consciously decide that it was time to stop. It would have to be something on the outside that would tell me to stop, whether that's like the bar closing, the party running out of alcohol, me being like physically incapable of like, getting something into my mouth anymore. Um, <laughs> something other than my brain being like, I think we've had enough. Let's stop for today. That never happened. Um, except for a few rare occasions where it's towards the end of my drinking when I'd be like, okay, Malika, we're just going to like have three drinks only after work and then actually go home, not stay till the bar closes. And when I like, like gave myself a 20 minute pep talk ahead of time, then I could do that. And they're like, sweet, I'm not alcoholic. And then the next night I wouldn't do that. And it would be the same pattern of like drinking until I was wasted um, or the bar closed. Um, so that was able to look at more clearly after I got sober. And then just remembering like, so I started drinking in high school and then in college, and would always, yeah, drink till blackout or passing out, um, and usually was staying the night wherever I was drinking, so I was able to think that I was being responsible that way, or if I was the designated driver, I would use other forms of alcohol that were socially acceptable where I grew up to go along with driving, and was like, I'm not drinking, I'm just getting super stoned and being the driver, um, so therefore I'm under control, um, and then... <laughs> I'm used to talking for 20 minutes. Anyways, through <laughs> through college and stuff, my drinking escalated. And there's just lots of experiences of 
feeling like super ashamed or not quite remembering what happened and like trying to gauge how I should feel by like expressions on other people's faces or how, what they were, weren't talking about. And just like this feeling of like feeling like icky and gross and ashamed, like all the time, but having to pretend like I was fine and super closed off to having any sort of help or support. Um, and that's something that I'm getting to unlearn now, like being open to sharing what I'm going through before I have it figured out. Cause before I'd have to like have it totally solved in my mind before I'd speak up about something to somebody else. And usually the way that I would solve things in my mind was pretty like twisted and mean, um, to myself and made things a much bigger deal than I needed to. So what happened, as I said, is I got in a car accident, which forced me to like suck it up and come to AA. And then I still didn't think that most of the program was for me. I just thought that I needed to stop drinking so I wouldn't actually hurt somebody or hurt myself. Um, but I felt that I was like too special um, or unique uh, for some program written by like white dudes a million years ago to be like, who do they know about me? Like I'm a mixed female in the 21st century. They don't know me. Um, but after being sober without working many steps for over a year, I started to feel crazy and finally like came to an emotional bottom and opened up to being ready to work the steps. Um, I ended up finding a new sponsor because not that it was my old sponsor's fault that I wasn't working the steps. I have a little bit of a guilt around that, but that change helped me like refocus into actually taking suggestions and not trying to figure out everything else um, on my own and taking suggestions from my sponsor, calling other alcoholics, um, and really taking the whole program more seriously. And I'm starting to feel some relief. As I said, I'm in the middle of my fourth step. Um, and it's uncomfortable, but it's really sort of incredible getting to realize that the that feeling I had that make it made it seem that like totally escaping into substances was a good choice. Um, wasn't just about the things that happened to me. I would victimize myself before and be like, oh, poor me. Like, I've had these horrible experiences. These terrible things have happened to me. Um, but I'm a good person. Um, but now it's like, oh, yes, bad things happen to me. But there's also something in my thinking um, that contributes to my own suffering and um, possibly causes harm to people around me. Like, I have character defects. I didn't think so at first. Um, and so it's really special getting to know myself more honestly. And I have had moments where I've been able to do things that I was never able to do before that I didn't think were possible, like actually let things go um, instead of holding on to them forever and have moments where I feel like I understand that word serenity more and feel like a peace and emptiness inside. Um, so realizing that part of the program isn't just about not drinking so I don't get in a car accident. It's about learning how to um, get help and adjust the way that I think so that the experience on the inside doesn't have to be so uncomfortable. Um, and I'm really grateful for that process. Um, to be super honest, um, once something is happening like today, well, within the past few days, I'm a teacher in Oakland, so we've been on strike for seven days, and we're going to vote tomorrow, and the whole thing has been, like, super exhausting and confusing, and um, it's a tricky balance of, like, trying to fight for something, but admitting that I'm powerless, but I can't be complacent, and um, all of that, and so I've had to really use my tools, um, learning, like, yesterday or on Friday, I had a total breakdown, my cravings were spiked, I was all hungry, angry, lonely, tired, all at once, all four of them, but I, I knew that I didn't have to do it alone, I called my sponsor, she suggested things I could do, she told me to find ways to be of service, here I am, like, picking up garbage when I'm exhausted, but, like, actually getting peace from that, um, and then today, like, right before I came here, I, my friend had given me a tincture to support my immune system. I was running out the door. I was like, ooh, I feel like I might be getting sick. I took some of it. I was like, oh, shit, that is made out of alcohol. And like freaking out, panicking, have I relapsed before I go speak at this meeting? And I called my sponsor again. She's like, if it's truly an accident, like that doesn't necessarily equal a relapse. But now we have to watch out for that phenomenon of craving. Because like just thinking about alcohol, like a tiny bit past my lips. But now I know that I can pray about that. I can talk to other people and reach out for support. And I don't have to like be ashamed and hide and not talk about it and like figure it out by myself. Like I can be honest and vulnerable and get through this instead of going back into that like uncomfortable hole of um, denial is what's 
I would do before I got sober. So thank you so much for letting me be of service today. It was sort of perfect. My higher power is showing up for me. I had this slip, and then I was on my way to be of service already anyways, um, which is what they say to do. So thank you, HP. Thank you for being here. Um, thanks for asking me to speak. Hi, I'm Grin. I'm an alcoholic. Oh, yeah. Is this on? All right. Um, Hold on, I'll put this in here. Assuming that's what that's going to be. Just like stealing your dollar. (laughs) Stole my dollar. (laughs) Jerk. Um, Yeah, uh, thank you. That was really awesome. Um, I've just been sitting here going, okay, God, I'm going to open my mouth, and hopefully not much of me is going to come out, and a little more of you is going to come out. Um, The more I do things like the 11th step, the more I realize that the world is a lot better place when I don't talk. Uh, when I don't say things, um, you know, if you haven't got to that step yet, it's really wonderful because you, you get this distance between you and the thing you want to do or the thing you're going to do. And so I, uh, and so I think, wow, I'm going to say this thing. No, you're not. That's stupid. That's harmful. Don't say that. And, uh, or I'm going to send this email. No, you're not. That's stupid. Don't do that. And, um, that's a real gift. Um, I'm from, San Francisco, and uh, I come from a long line of Scots Irish Methodists. Uh, we're doomed. Um, we're doomed. We're the most. I mean, we may have overrun half the half the earth, but we are the most depressed, most alcoholic people statistically, um, and uh, we just can't stop beating up on ourselves. My grandfather broke with the Methodists because he wanted to drink. Uh, and it was interfering with that. So um, he kind of suddenly my family became Unitarian, which what does that even mean? Um, so uh, and he and then my father were both really into this whole thing about drinking. You know, they, they like to get drunk and read the fucking Rubaiyats and um, and talk about how lovely and wonderful and inspiring it was. And um, and I grew up really hating that, you know, because my dad could really only tell me he loved me when he was drunk. Um and yet, uh, as a as a kid, I I really felt like there was some piece of my brain missing, and I couldn't figure out what it was. I would go to school, and I would see these other kids doing stuff, and I couldn't figure out what they were doing. And they would talk to me, and I couldn't figure out what they were saying. And they'd say hello, and I didn't know what they meant by that. And I was just really um, – I had this big wall between me and other people. And the first time I got drunk was in uh, – junior high with a friend who came over uh, and we proceeded to cocktail everything in my folks liquor cabinet like all of it and uh, suddenly it was the wow the missing piece of my brain is back I can I can actually I can actually do this now I'm I'm funny I'm smart I'm I'm cool and uh, I was found later having blacked out naked in my parents bed um <laughs> having having made a mess of the bathroom and, and you know and the thing is I I didn't drink as much as some of y'all but um I drank alcoholically from the very beginning it was the only way I wanted to drink uh as soon as I had that in me I knew I wanted to be as drunk as possible for as much of my waking hours as I could possibly do and I carried that off into high school and I decided that uh I was going to, I was just going to do this. I was going to, every time I wanted to get drunker, I wanted to get drunker than the time before. Um, and I, I would think, well, you know, this might ruin my health or it might kill me, but so what? It's the eighties, you know, um, <laughs> Reagan is president. We're all going to die. So who cares? And so I was just taking it to that, to that place. And I had this whole idea. I was going to leave this really tragically short body of poetry behind and people would be really sorry that I died, you know? Um, <laughs> And, uh, you know, Reagan killed him. Uh. I also decided in uh, back in Montessori school, I'm a product of Montessori education, um, that I could tell any lie I wanted. And as long as I told it long enough and hard enough and, and insistently enough um, and wore the other person down, that meant I won. And so I went and I tried it on a preschooler and it worked. Um, so I, I made that into a recipe for life. Um, and AA has no opinion on the fact that you can now do that and become president. But anyway, um, 
Uh, yeah, he has no opinion on that. Um, and that that actually made life really difficult, and I ended up in a lot of really bad 80s relationships. We were doing a lot of speed back then, and um, 1986 was the summer of speed, we called it, um, where people would come over and, like, completely get, you know, chewed up in your bathroom and then start seeing things and cutting themselves with razors in your friend's room, and you had to, you know, there was a lot of drama going on. And I was going out with a speed freak in the 80s, uh, and that was great. And um, because I was alcoholic, I had no, you know, I just had no boundaries. I had no sense of who I was. I never had had that, you know, um, in the family I grew up in. Um, sorry, I got to backpedal to that because that was the late 60s, and everybody was really fucked up then. Um, nobody knew what was going on. My brother was doing acid in the hate and coming home on mushrooms. And my dad, my parents were trying to have him arrested um, so he wouldn't leave home again. So we'd have these knockdown drag outs in the middle of the night. And I'm like four. Um, and uh, my mom wanted to. My mom was a very beautiful, intelligent, confused person who thought that um, getting married would make her life make sense and it didn't and so she thought having a kid would make her life make sense and it didn't and so she got very depressed and she drank herself through that until about 1999 no 2002 uh, when she had her gallbladder removed um, so there's nobody around when I was a kid and uh, as a result I, there was really you know I've, I've had kids of my own now and you really have to pour things into them you really have to uh, you have to constantly be kind of reminding them how, who they are, you know, and I never got that. Um, so when I was in a relationship with a speed freak, she would tell me things like that I was Satan and that I had, and that in a previous life I had killed crazy horse. And, um, and I believed it. I believed all of it. She wrote these long novels about me on the wall, you know, the marker. And, and I believed all of it. I believed all of it. And, um, she was uh, she was my nine eleven. I was she just smashed into me and destroyed me, and I ended up um, that that was you know I I couldn't drink enough to make that okay somehow. I I was working in a print shop toward the end, and the only reason they didn't fire me was because I was good at printing envelopes on their finicky ass machine. Um, you know I could string up enough rubber bands and pencils to make that thing work and print all the envelopes that Mount Zion Hospital would ever need. So they couldn't fire me, um, and I would go to work late. I would um, work for about an hour. I'd go in the bathroom and cry, and then go back up and work a little while longer, and then go have an Alpine White candy bar for lunch, and then go work some more and cry, and then come home, And uh, which was back then was back at my parents' house because um, I couldn't really live anywhere else, and nobody could really deal with me, and they couldn't deal with me either. They were just retiring upstairs and not even, you know, uh, so they, uh, so I was, when I got home from work, I, <clears throat> they, that was the moment where I thought, well, I'm free, you know, I'm, I'm done with work and this is, you know, uh, now is, this is me time and me time was me making screwdrivers out of anything I could find and, um, staying up until the Avengers came on. And that was, that was it. That was, you know, that was my idea of a, of a real party of life. And I, uh, and then the next day I would take a cab to work just to have an extra 15 minutes to sleep in because I was hung over. So, um, so like I said, I didn't drink as much as a lot of y'all, but whenever I used to, when I was new and I used to go to high noon in San Francisco and I used to whine about, you know, I'm not as much of an alcoholic as you guys. And they would just turn to me and say, Grant, you made screwdrivers out of rubbing alcohol. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what kind of kept me at it. Um, that and the fact that um, you guys really had something. And the first meeting I went to was in Seattle. And uh, this woman took me to a meeting. We'd been talking on the bus, uh, on the Green Tortoise bus. And uh, she told me she was in AA. And and I told her that I was, I, well, I'm a recovering alcoholic too, because she was cute. And she, but what I was really, but what really blew my mind was she didn't, you know, say, well, oh, well, are you an AA? Or how did you, you know, she just said, are you, are you not drinking? That's great. That's great. And she didn't ask me why or how I was not drinking. She didn't try to convert me to anything. And that made me curious. 
So uh, she took me to a meeting in the U District, and uh, and I always say at that meeting, they I always felt like she she called everybody beforehand and told them what to say because okay, this guy's coming. And he's like this, so you guys all should say this. <laughs> and everybody, because everything everybody said, it was like I was nailed to the wall by everything everybody said. Um, and I just felt like, okay, I've, I've found these people. And when I started going to meetings in the city, what I especially found was that, you know, I thought I was really, I thought I was this really kind of moody, poetical, you know, kind of crows flying over my head kind of guy. <laughs> And uh, really deep. I'm really, really deep. And I, and I tried that on at the dry dock, and I found out that I was actually hysterically funny to people. Um, that they thought I was hilarious, the shit I was saying. And, um, and that gave me a new perspective. I, I'm not afraid to talk to groups of people because it's about, it's about sharing the message. It's not about, you know, um, hopefully it's not about me. I hear a lot these days, you know, share the message, not the mess. Um, I like to hardly disagree with that because um, when I was new, I really needed people to bring the mess. I really needed a, a guy with 16 years to talk about how terrified they still were of other people. Um, that kept me kept me coming back. You know, the people who could really honestly talk about where they were at and I could relate to those people. And uh, when I was uh, going to meetings in San Francisco, there was, well, there were a lot of things going on. Um, Jonathan Bradshaw had hit the meetings really hard and everybody suddenly had an inner child and everybody had, <laughs> I swear, like at least 80% of the people in all the meetings suddenly decided that their parents had tried to sacrifice them to Satan at some point. And so there was all that going on and, um, and it was really weird. And then there was a lot of, um, real there was a lot of controversy people were fomenting about you know whether we should do the lord's prayer or whether things should be gender specific or not and and it was you know and but what i learned from all that is that you know i saw meetings go under around that i saw a lot of people get angry and leave um but when a meeting went under went under another one started and none of this stuff could kill aa somehow um, and in the eighties, I'd run around with anarchists, you know, like real anarchists, you know, and, and going to like little anarchist meetings and talking about anarchist stuff and all the anarchist things we're going to do. And, um, we could not hold a piss, a piss up in a brewery. We couldn't get anything done at all. And I end up in an organization like this and it's basically an anarchist organization. Nobody's really in charge. Um, the leaders are just there to read that thing and, and show me a yellow thing at some point. And nobody's, you know, nobody's in charge. And and it totally works. Um, and it works everywhere. And I, so I've been to meetings in Alaska. Uh, I spent my first six months, uh, about my first six months sober in Alaska with crazy rednecks in Wasilla who I never would have drunk with these people. I never would have associated with these people in my life. Um, they're the kind of people who have, they have Christmas lights on their trailers all year round. And, you know, they were just, they had like hand tool covers for their leather covers for their big books and hand tool leather covers for their, um, you know, for their 100 menthol cigarettes. And um, they were intense, <laughs> but they, they took me in and I'm this weirdo from California and they just, they took me completely under their wing. And these, these two ladies, um, Dina and JD green, uh, you know, I was, I was so miserable and, and fucked up and didn't know how to be around people at all. And, uh, you know, if we all went out, you know, if we went out to coffee and we went to a diner and there was a booth with four seats and there were four of us and the three people sat down, I was sitting in the next booth. Because I just didn't think I belonged in that seat. I didn't belong in that booth with those other people. And these people would just kind of let me do that. And I would go to their house and I'd sit in a corner. And and they would say things to me like, you know, you stick with me, son. I'm a crone. That's a wise old woman. Um, <laughs> it's not change that hurts. It's resistance, you know. And, and they they totally just propped me up at a time when I really needed it. Um, I got my first sponsor in Wasilla. Um, I like to say he was the only sensitive male in Wasilla. 
and he's lived out by the lake and he's this amazing guy as a masseuse and uh one of the things he told me you know we, we went out to coffee and he listened to me for a while and I had all these designs about being a real Alaska dude. And he said, you are not an Alaska dude. You are not going to move up here. Um, that's not going to happen. You're, <laughs> you won't survive. Um, so you have an opportunity now. You're here for a little while. So why don't you take this opportunity to take all that shit you're carrying around and leave it here? And then you can, like every other tourist does, and then you can go back and um, give it to, you know, and, and bring yourself, you know, to the people you really care about back home. So, um, so I did that. And that, so that was my first experience of really doing the steps and doing a fourth step and um, doing a really thorough fifth step with somebody, which was like, it was like ripping my skin off doing that. I'm so not um, programmed that way. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, to just have this guy sit there and listen to me and listen to me and listen to me and smoke and listen to me. <laughs> and, um, and I'll never forget that. I'll never forget that. Um, and that's what really showed me how this whole thing works. Um, the other thing that happened fairly new, and that's, I think the most meaningful stuff for me is the stuff that happened in early sobriety because, um, it was really formative and, it was really weird. I, we're all really weird people. And and I really appreciate that because AA is here to, I think, make us who we really are. It's not to make you into some slogan spouting automaton or, um, you know, to make you more of the kind of person who reads the book all the time and quotes the book all the time. That's great. But really, it's there to make us who we are. It's it's there to set us free. It's, it's here to make me free. And um, And the more free you are, the more free I can be because you guys push the boundaries in all directions and I get to be myself because you guys give me room to do that. So I was at uh, 208 Dolores, which was a meeting place that burned down in San Francisco a while ago. And I was sharing um, completely off topic about airplanes. Um, I like airplanes. And this guy walked up to me and, and said, um, you know, uh, I fly out of Petaluma every now and then. And, uh, you know, do you want to go flying? And I said, sure. And so I, I went up to see him. He lived up in a houseboat in Marin. And the more I talked to him, he was weird. He was weird. And I was a little, you know, leery of this guy. But, you know, I thought, well, let's let's do this. So we went and we rented a plane. And he showed me how to do the walk-around check. And we got in the plane. He showed me how to taxi. I was not good at taxiing. Um and then we got to the end of the runway, and he showed me how to run up the engine and check the oil pressure. And I thought, well, this is all good information. Um, and he said, okay, well, when you're ready, release the brake. <laughs> I was like, what? And he said, yeah, you're taking the plane off. Um, so, uh, you know, he said, I'll tell you when to pull back on the wheel. You've got to get a certain amount of speed. So I just, you know, revved it up, released the brake. And, we just came roaring off and I took off the plane by myself. And, and, uh, and then he said, well, by the way, there's, he, he lit up a cigarette and said, there's no smoking in the plane. <laughs> and, and then we flew like to nut tree or something and had some really harrowing times. And then, <laughs> then I never saw him again. <laughs> and so that's the kind of weird stuff that, that happens here. <laughs> um, the other, uh, you know, it, there was the AIDS AIDS crisis was happening in full swing when I was new, and uh, and it was intense because I was in San Francisco and I was going to a lot of meetings with a lot of um, a lot of gay men who were literally like there and then gone. You know, um, and people would die really suddenly um, out of nowhere. They they called it cryptococcal meningitis, which means we don't know what the fuck it is uh, meningitis, and <laughs> they. Uh, so this one guy asked me to be a sponsor and I was about six years in. And by that time I, you know, I had not done steps in a long time. I hadn't been actively sponsored in a long time. Oh God, 20 minutes. Yeah. I'm, I'm already sober. Okay. All right. All right. Um, <laughs> I'm just putting just barely, in just barely. I was holding on by a thread. I was really pissed off. Um, a lot of my social awkwardness was really playing out in meetings and I just couldn't deal with people and 
uh, I sure as hell couldn't get a date and I was mad about that. And, um, and so I was really just trapped in my own, uh, and this guy asked me to sponsor him and I'm like, Oh crap. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, this guy, Mark, and, uh, he, uh, he had AIDS. He was, uh, in a sober living environment for people with AIDS and he had done a lot of speed. He lost a lot of his teeth. He'd grown up in foster homes and, uh, and he wanted to do steps, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and, and so we started doing steps and, uh, found out so much about this guy. I mean, you know, his, his upbringing and how abusive it was and just what a shitty life he'd, he'd had and how eager he was. He was just so eager for the solution and he wanted it. He wanted it really bad. And, um, and then a weekend later he died, just went into the hospital. He was dead the next day. So, uh, they had a memorial and there were four people at this memorial. It was, uh, his roommate, the two nurses at the hospital who used to give him his drips every day and me and nobody else knew that he died or cared or anything. And I, uh, and I realized listening to people that I'd known this guy two weeks and I knew more about him than anybody in that room. Uh, so that was, I don't know, I guess that was kind of a saving private Ryan moment. You know, um, I wanted to be worthy of that. I wanted to, um, I wanted to feel like I could pay that forward. So I've, I've tried to do that. I've tried to do that. And, uh, we lost a lot of people in that period. And I'll never forget this guy who was in the, we were visiting him in the hospital and his, his feet had swollen up to the size of softballs and he was just a mess. And he's sitting there on the phone with somebody saying, well, listen, have you ever tried a God box? You know, God boxes are great. You should try. <laughs> he's like sponsoring somebody on the phone, you know, and he's, and he's in the hospital and he, you know, anyway. Um, so I did go through, I, I've been through a lot of periods and uh, I've gone through the, you know, the, the uh, peevish and disagreeable hipster period that lasted a long time. Uh, I've gone through the uh, patronizing Buddhist period. That was fun. <laughs> people really people really enjoyed that. Um, and eventually, uh, now, well, so I, I married this person. I don't know how that happened. Um, and she's really neat. She's from England. And um, so now we've got this whole English connection. I've been to meetings in Manchester and in North Wales and uh, in a part of Ireland where they allegedly spoke English, but I could not understand where they were saying. Um, and, uh, I just met some crazy, beautiful, amazing people. And when I first visited in England, you know, we visited with her parents who were Methodists. It's coming full circle. Um, and they were, they were sitting there talking about their couch and how, you know, we have a couch and it's, and it's brown. Our neighbors have a couch and it's also brown, but it's slightly larger. Um, would you like to see our curtains? And I was like, I need to go to a meeting now. <laughs> and they were, and they were like, oh dear, dear, this is, uh, oh, hmm. And so I, you know, we figured it out how I could catch a bus from Lost a Call and get into Preston and do all this. And, uh, and then they saw me after they saw me with five days without meetings, and then they saw me right after. And now they'll drive me anywhere I want to go. <laughs> they'll take me to Blackpool, anything. You know, they're 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 stoked. Um, the uh, people people over there, meetings over there are strange, um, and I judge them a lot. And now what I do is um, I don't wait until I'm out of my mind to go to a meeting when we go to England. Like I I figure out where the meetings are and I go right then. And that seems to work better <laughs> somehow. Uh, and I have, oh, and this is the real practical joke. Like I didn't want to outlive the Reagan years and now I have two kids and I'm having a midlife crisis. That was not supposed to happen mm-hmm. at all. Um, and I have two really neat kids who, you know, are just, they're not, they're not fucked up. I mean, my son just got a job and he enjoys it and they like him and he works hard. I was the most, the most arrogant, unteachable mess, like long into sobriety, like, like having jobs, you know, I worked in, I'm a cabinet maker and I worked in this shop in Marin, which I should have been on my knees grateful for because they really knew their shit. And I learned a lot from them. 
uh, but they yelled at me. I didn't, I didn't like it. You know, they were, they, they were, they talked mean to me. I didn't like that. And, uh, the boss called me in and he was going to just, you know, call my attention to something. And I started ripping into him and telling him what an abusive workplace this was. And I just went on and on. And finally he, you know, he listened to that really patiently and he said, you know, Grant, I don't know you very well, but don't you have some sort of spiritual thing that you're doing? I mean, <laughs> don't you? And, and so I went home and I, and I told my wife, you know, well, I, I, they said this, but I said that. And they said this, but I, I said, Bleh. and she listened to me for a while and she said, okay, you need to call somebody. And it can't be that guy that blows sunshine out of your ass. You need to call that cranky gay guy. You need to call him. And, and I have nothing more to say to you. <laughs> and she left the room. And, uh, and I called the cranky gay guy and he listened to me as I went on and said, you know, well, they said this and I said that. And they said, you think you're better than they are, don't you? And I said, shit. Uh, so, so he got me. So that's the thing. I'm supposed to get sober, but you know, I haven't always acted sober. I've, this has been a long, stupid road for me in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't have it any other way. Um, you know, when they say, wish you a long, slow recovery. Um, yeah, that's, that's what we're having here. Um, 29, 29 inexplicable years. Um, in spite of my best efforts, a lot of the time it, you know, I seem to be still doing this and it's given me, um, very slowly, um, just a lot of tools for just living life that I didn't have naturally. So I got a parking ticket two days ago and, and I just felt really sorry for this woman who had to give me parking tickets. That was my first, you know, that it's not always like that, but that was my first, my first reaction is like, oh, you poor thing. You have to give parking tickets to people. Sure. I'll take your parking ticket. You know, it's like she was selling cookies or something. <laughs> like, yeah, I'll take your, I'll take your parking ticket. You poor thing. You know, where, where did that come from? You know, I was, um, I was a terrible road rager and um, about about four years in, I was going to SF State and I was stuck behind somebody who was going slowly. She's just going slow. And how dare she go slow because I want to go fast. And so I, I was trying to get around her, but I couldn't because I had to get off at the off ramp and she was getting off too. And she was making me go slow on the off ramp, which I was livid, right? I was just like really livid. <laughs> And, but I was stuck in the same lane. There's only one lane and she wasn't good. And so finally we got down to the light and, uh, and there was another lane I could get around her. So I just went roaring around her and it got to the light, you know, okay, it's a red light. Ha ha. You got to the red light three seconds before this person, you know, <laughs> fantastic. And it just came roaring over and I looked over like, Ugh. and it was this old, old woman with this look of terror on her face. And she was, <laughs> and I could see her mouthing the words like, what are you doing? <laughs> and so I try to remember that. <laughs> you know, I try to look at myself sometimes in the mirror and go, what are you doing? <laughs> um, so last thing is, um, uh, I've been, so, well, raising kids was really weird. And um, I had to learn a lot about myself. I was not, um, you know, if you ever want to find out that it's not all about you, uh, that's, that's the thing to do. And, and I didn't like it not being all about me. I really didn't like it. Uh, I really didn't like these people with their terroristic demands and their, uh, <laughs> and they're throwing shit on the floor and all that. It was horrible. Um, but what I really didn't like was what I turned into, especially when they wouldn't sleep. Like I just turned into like, I, I turned into my dad. I turned into this like, angry, angry, like spiteful, mean asshole. And, um, and I realized like my dad couldn't control this. My dad didn't have any tools. I do. I have support. I have tools and I can get through this, but he didn't have that. So maybe I can lighten up on him a little bit. Um, the, uh, and, and as a result, I mean, there were, there were some really rough times. I didn't, I didn't act right. And, uh, but my kids and I are really good friends now. We're really close. And I think it's because no matter what, I stuck around. Uh, I wouldn't, 
I was not allowed to just sort of, you know, dissolve into self pity and, and wander off somewhere. Um, I had to stick around and I had to just do better the next day and do better the next day. And, and they got to see that they got to see what that looks like. And I think, um, and I think they appreciate that now. I think they, they appreciate, um, knowing that about me. And I'm, you know, I'm pretty clear, like, you know, there's no grown ups in this house, you know, um, we're, I've, I've been doing this a little longer than you have, but you know, if you, if you meet a grown up, let me know. There's, um, so now being part of the sandwich generation, um, I got to hospice my dad about, uh, five years ago at home. And that was, uh, that was kind of amazing. And, uh, there were, there were points where he had this massive stroke and so he couldn't really talk. And at one point he just went into this place of bliss. It was really strange. Like his, his eyes were, were just watering and he was just smiling and looking up and I was rolling him over and I was like washing his hair or something. And, and he was just looking at me with this like look of pure, pure love. And I was like, okay, I'll take that. That's cool. All right. That, that, that took a while, but you know, <laughs> that's good. Thank you. Thank you for that. And, and now we're, we're in it with my mom and my mom is different. She's not just going to have a stroke and die in two weeks. She is going to, she's going to make us pay and pay is what she's going to do. Um, it's been a really, that, that's been a really rough time because around Christmas I was with her on my own, the wife and kids were in England and I really thought she was on her way out. You know, things were getting really strange and the next day she was up like doing crossword puzzles and ordering me around again. And, um, what I turned into when things didn't go the way I expected and it didn't go in the trajectory I thought it should, the person I turned into was amazing. I was just, I was just so mad at her. You know, like lady, you had one job, you know, what, what is your, you know, what's going on? And, uh, she, so she's been going on for a while now and I've, and I've, you know, I've been getting a lot of support and people have been really awesome. And I found out that she, that she has sundown syndrome, which means that, you know, she just gets super freaked out in the evening and it's really irrational and it's all over the place. And, but we get this, we got this really cool chaplain who came in who just, you know, he, he got her in about 15, in about 15 minutes, he got her, he got me, he got us, you know, he figured that all out. And he said, you know, your mom has abandonment issues. This is about stuff that's happened 85 years ago for you. This is about stuff that happened 50 years ago. Um, you know, just be aware of that. And so after, after a visit with him, we should talk to him for a while. And I wasn't, I'm not in the room for any of that. I was washing her hair and she, uh, you know, and she said, you're washing my hair. And I said, well, yeah. And she said, because you love me. And I said, well, yeah. And then she starts crying and crying. And I said, no, mom, mom, calm down. Just say you love me too. <laughs> and she's like, oh, okay, great. You know, that, that took 85 years, mom. That's great. And, um, and here we are and we both feel unlovable and, uh, and we just did that. That's good. Isn't that good that we did that? And, um, and that was a good moment. That was a good moment. So I'm glad she didn't pop off on Christmas Eve. Um, every day is a day with that. And if I have any kind of strength or mental agility to do that kind of shit, um, it's because, it's because of this program and the people who are, have been available to me the whole time and who re remind me to lighten up on myself because I, you know, I, I, I serve a vengeful and forgiving God. And to just let, uh, to, to let me be me and, uh, to know that I'm not always going to get it right. I really want to get it right. I want you all to, to see me as somebody who gets it right. Um, and I don't know how else to, uh, I don't know how else to interact with people sometimes. And, oh, it's five minutes. Good. I'll, I'll see that and I'll raise you three. How about that? Um, and I'm still, you know, and so as far as like, you know, the guy was 16 years talking about, he's still terrified of people. I'm still terrified of y'all. I am still stupidly awkward at meetings. 
um, especially, you know, what I call who's who meetings, you know, where there's, everybody's hanging out and everybody knows each other and it's all groovy. I just can't. I, I've never been able to insinuate myself into a scene like that. I've never been able to hang out. Um, I can't stand to, to feel like I'm just standing there and, you know, I, I can't stand to feel like Billy Nomades out in the, out in the parking lot. So, so I walk off pretty quick because I can't deal with that feeling. Um, and that's always been a problem. And I, I expect that, you know, like most character defects, it'll be, um, lifted quickly or slowly in the fullness of time. But, um, that's always been a deal. Um, I've never been, you know, a real social butterfly in this thing. Um, and because I'm so awkward, you know, I, sometimes I look for love in all the wrong places in all the wrong ways. And, um, you know, social media destroyed me. <laughs> Absolutely destroyed me. I'm still putting my life back together after that. Um, so, um, so I just want you to know, you know, warts and all, it's like, yeah, I've, I've 29 years, but, um, I'm still working through some stuff. I'm still trying. Um, and every day is just a new day to try. What I do is I get up and I, um, I pray for God to be with me and to kind of part the curtain and help me see that God's working in the world and help me to work alongside somehow to find a way to work, to work with that work and that my hands and my mind and my heart will be guided that way. I have a home group. It's called Dolphin Quest. I have a sponsor who forgot he was my sponsor until I reminded him. And, um, and that's about it. Thanks very much. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.